All right, congratulations. You are on the fifth and last video in this series. We are gonna take everything you have learned so far and apply it to some of our most significant weather on our planet. Now, by the end of the video, you're gonna feel like a real weather person. So let's get started. My name is Bob Roberts. I am an aerospace education officer for Civil Air Patrol in Greenville, South Carolina. Now, by the end of this video, you're gonna be able to do really five things, right? So number one, I want you to be able to define an air mass, and identify the air mass characteristics. Number two, define a front and describe the types of fronts. Number three, describe hurricanes, thunderstorms, and tornadoes. Number four, identify the stages of a thunderstorm. And finally, number five, outline safety precautions for thunderstorms and tornadoes. Now, when we think of weather, we tend to think of it in the larger weather patterns that affect how you're going to live your day based on the weather outside. Now, these are driven by larger air masses. These can sometimes be thousands of miles across or even bigger. Now, these large air masses will drive your local weather and they are constantly battling other large air masses for supremacy of the skies. Now, these battles create severe storms such as hurricanes, tornadoes, and massive lines of powerful and damaging thunderstorms. Now, in Civil Air Patrol, we actually just lost a really nice airplane in South Carolina when a tornado touched down of all places at a local airport and it ripped through the hangar and the airplane was sitting inside the hangar and the airplane's trashed. So uh, these air masses hold a general temperature and moisture level throughout the entire air mass, making it ideal to be able to track their movements and using them to help determine what the future weather will be. The area where the air mass forms is called the source region. Now the source region is really going to dictate the conditions inside of the air mass because as that air mass is gonna move, it's gonna carry with it those characteristics from that source region. Now the source regions need to be pretty uniform throughout the entire area. This is why you don't usually see source regions forming at the boundary of water and land. Now the tropical and polar locations are often the most stable for creating air masses as a source region. The tropical regions stay hot and rarely if ever will develop snow or frost. Now the polar regions are much colder and will develop snow, ice, and frost. These source regions can be identified by a two-letter code. The first letter indicates the type of surface that the region sits over. There are only two options. You're either over land or you're over water. If you're over land, we call it continental, and we use a lowercase letter c. Now, continental regions will tend to have less moisture in the air mass. Now, if you're over water, we call it maritime, and we use a lowercase letter m. Since the maritime air masses are over the water, they tend to absorb that water and have a higher percentage of moisture. Now that we have the first half of the air mass classification, we're going to look at the second half. And to that, we need to talk about temperature at given latitudes. Now we indicate that as Arctic, polar, tropical, and equatorial. Arctic being the coldest regions and the equatorial being the hottest. Now we use uppercase letters for these classifications, so capital A for Arctic, capital P for polar, capital T for tropical, and finally capital E for equatorial. Now the Arctic and polar regions are pretty similar and they're cool, and the tropical and equatorial regions are also pretty similar being warmer. Now put it all together and we get a map that's gonna look like this. Now for the United States, we are under a continental polar, which means that our area is on land, which is drier and tends to be cooler. These air masses can either try staying in one general place for long periods of time, or they, be, they can begin to move and try to push other air masses out of the way. The leading edge of a moving air mass is called a front, or the front of the moving air mass. Depending on the type of air mass and its movement, we categorize them as warm fronts, cold fronts, stationary fronts, where two air masses basically just push against each other, but neither is strong enough to win the line between them, and it just moves really slowly. And then the last category is the occluded front, which is when a third air mass joins the party, usually a cold air mass. Now remember that warm air rises and cold air descends. This is gonna help you when you visualize what's going to happen when these air masses meet at the front. Now if it's a warm air mass pushing into a cold air mass, we call that a warm front. Since warm air rises, it slides over the top of the cold air mass. The front of a warm air mass can be a, extend for really long distances. Now, if it's a cold air mass pushing into a warm air mass, we call it a cold front, makes sense. Since cold air is more dense, it acts more of a wall and pushes the warm air out of its way in a much smaller distance. 
Now this creates a wall of more severe weather at that line. Now you can often tell exactly where that cold front is by the faster moving and more severe clouds and weather. And talking about occluded fronts, I'm going to take the description right from the aerospace dimensions module. Occluded fronts involve three differing air masses and are classified as either cold occluded or warm occluded. In the cold occluded, cold air moves in and collides with warmer air, pushing the warm air aloft. Then the leading edge of this cold front comes in contact with the trailing edge of the cooler surface air that was below the warm air. Now, because the advancing air is the coldest, it sinks to the surface and causes the cooler air to rise. However, the cooler air is still cooler than the warm air, so it continues to push the warm air above it. Now, in the warm occluded front, cool air is advancing to collide with the air in your area. Now, since the cooler air is warmer than the cooler surface air, the, colder, the cooler air rides up over the cold air. Once again, though, the cooler air is cooler than the warm air that was already aloft. So the cooler air continues to push the warmer air up. Okay, end of that. So now that we understand what the types of fronts are, let's see how we show them on a map so that you can look for them yourself. Now the cold fronts have triangles, or I like to think of them as icicles, they're blue triangles. So the warm fronts have half circles, red half circles, or you can think of them as half suns since they're hotter. Now the stationary front takes those two symbols and it alternates between the two of them showing that the fronts are pushing against each other and not really moving in one direction or the other. The occluded front is really a cold front that is pushing a warm front out of the way fast enough that it actually is catching up with a trailing edge of another cold front. So we show that as two triangles and one circle. So in my mind, two icicles and one sun. So we are now going to move into our last section of the video series as we talk about the severe weather. We're going to focus on thunderstorms, tornadoes, and hurricanes. These weather patterns can cause incredible damage and take away people's lives, unfortunately. In our previous lesson where we talked about clouds, you can see that here if you want to learn more, we discussed the queen of all clouds, and that is a cumulonimbus cloud. Now, this cloud can have a massive instability with the air inside moving up and down at great speeds. This brings warm air at the lower levels and bringing all that kinetic energy into the higher altitudes. But it doesn't just stay there because it quickly moves back down again where it once again is reheated and it moves back up. Round and round this movement of the air goes where it can keep adding more and more kinetic energy from the lower atmosphere into the higher. Also, because of the faster moving air, it can hold more condensation onto the particulate before the rain or ice fall out of the cloud. This means larger water droplets or far more damaging and incredibly destructive larger diameter hail. If Elsa from Frozen ever really had to fight a bad guy in a movie, all she would ever really need to do is create lots of hail and it could destroy just about anything in its path. So you're welcome, Disney, for the idea work on that. I expect some money. So thunderstorms start from a cumulonimbus and have thunder and lightning. The lightning is basically a supercharged shock like you would get when you walk across a carpet floor and touch something that takes that electrical charge from you, but a much higher scale. I mean, we're talking millions of volts of electricity and that air can heat up to 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit, incredibly hot. This creates a huge fast moving shock wave of superheated air. And that's the thunder that you hear. These thunderstorms can bring with them the heavy rains and hail that we talked about earlier. The winds felt on the ground can also be very fast, 40, 50 miles an hour, or even greater. Now we tend to classify the thunderstorm into three distinct phases. The building phase is where all the air mass begins its vertical movement or updrafts. You will see the cloud getting taller and taller as the air mass moves higher into the atmosphere. At some point, all the moisture that has been carried up into the cloud will get heavier. It will begin to fall out of the cloud when the updraft can no longer support the weight of this condensation. This falling condensation in the form of rain or hail will create its own downdrafts. Now we call this, this phase the mature phase. The last phase is the dissipating phase. At this phase, the cumulonimbus cloud is no longer able to move the air mass vertical with the updrafts. And instead, it is pushing the air mass down with all downdrafts. So the key to understanding the stage of the cloud it's by understanding the movement of the air inside of it. If it's basically all vertical updrafts that make up the building phase, then the downdrafts start to form 
and create movement up and down in the cloud, and that's the mature phase. And then when there's no more updrafts, it's only all downdrafts, we call it the dissipating phase. So our planet is alive with thunderstorms. We can get nearly 100 lightning strikes on the Earth every single second. If you get stuck in a thunderstorm, make sure you're not in water, because you also don't want to be the tallest or shiniest object outside. Um, basically no metal. And if you're a pilot, just imagine flying on one of these because of the updrafts and downdrafts, we know the turbulence could be extreme. Now, depending on the type of aircraft you're in, it may even exceed the structural capability of that design. Or at the very least, it may make you or your passengers never want to fly again. So do your absolute best to avoid these storms. They're pretty from the outside, but they're super ugly to us if we're flying on them in the inside. Now let's shift over to talking about tornadoes. They can be the absolute most destructive weather on the planet. They can have localized speeds of over 350 miles an hour and can basically just destroy just about everything that's in their path. Now, in order for them to be called a tornado, they do have to touch the ground. Now, the United States gets about 700 tornadoes a year, and with global warming, we are expecting to see a larger number of tornadoes in the future. Now, tornadoes are formed by very low air pressure. Almost think of what happens when you flush a toilet. They move counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and they move clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Air is sucked in at high speeds at the center bottom, and that air is lifted rapidly around the core. Now, we have vacuum cleaners that actually work the same exact way, so you can thank Mother Nature for those. And like a vacuum cleaner, the tornado sucks in dirt and debris from the ground that it travels over, thus making the tornado darker. Now, these tornadoes can travel up to 70 miles an hour on the ground, which makes it difficult to outrun them. Now, it is outside of the scope of this video, but you would be wise to learn how to take precautions on how to anticipate and prepare for tornadoes. Don't be lulled into a false sense of safety because you think they happen in another part of the country. Tornadoes happen in every single state. Our last of the severe weather patterns is the hurricane. Now, these winds are not as strong as tornadoes, but they cover a very large area, easily seen from space. Now, because of that, they can cause destruction over a much larger area with winds going all the way up to over 150 miles an hour. They also form over the oceans and pick up a great deal of moisture, which they can drop onto the ground. This acts as a double punch, with the wind hitting you, but also a large amount of rain, which can cause massive and widespread flooding. This can devastate large areas along the coastlines. Now, one interesting part of a hurricane is the eye, which is a central area that the hurricane spins around. Inside the eye, it might even be sunny and calm, but all around you is the massive storm. The eyes of the hurricane are usually pretty large themselves, being 10 to 15 miles in diameter, but know that once the eye passes over you, the wind will go right back to being as bad as it was before you entered the eye. Obviously, unless you are designed for it, like the hurricane hunting aircraft that you see here, you don't want to be flying, or boating for that matter, near one of these. Now with all of these, your best option from aviation is to be someplace else. Well, that wraps up not just our conversation on severe weather, but also on this whole entire video series on the air environment. I hope you learned a great deal. And if you are a CAP cadet, and this has helped you to pass your module exam, I'm hoping that you can post it down in the comments below the squadron you came from. Now you can go to this playlist if you want to see the other videos in this series and you haven't already. If this was useful, please hit the like button and if you want to see more of these videos when they come out, please hit the subscribe button. By doing so, you're really going to help the channel out and make it easier for other people to find this channel. Well, that's it. Thanks, everyone. I hope uh, we'll see you in the next video, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye.